Your wisdom is everlasting, and your power is never-ending. You will reign as king forever. Lord, you are holy, and your glory shines over us. You created the sky and the beautiful clouds that reside in it, the majestic mountains and the deep sea. You saw that these were good. You made us in your own image, and you saw that it was very good. Thank you, Lord, for your love and blessings you give us every month. You give us strength, peace, and joy. Lord, in the past few years, all of us have faced challenges and struggles and continue to face them today. Thank you for giving us life and freedom to face these challenges. Thank you for your, the gift of your son and the chance that we can live today to declare who you are and what your son did for us. Lord, some of us are here to receive our degrees and enter into this world. Others are here to support those beginning their new adventures. As we sit here, I pray that your Holy Spirit is present and active. May you be glorified during our time together. And as our time comes to a close here at Nebraska Christian College, I ask that your spirit will be present in all of the lives of these students. I pray that as we continue into our ministries, people will see your love in our lives. I pray that they will see joy, laughter, and strength in us because of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you change lives through us and that you will be glorified. Lord, you are good, and your kingdom will reign forever. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Uh, today I'll be reading from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Join with me. Thank you. 
Thank you. As Reed comes to share with us, I, I want to give everybody a chance to get seated. We've, we've got some seats down here, and uh, I'd like to give you all opportunity. Everyone get a place to sit? Okay. Reed, come share with us. I want to read for us today one of my favorite passages in Scripture to remind us that although we may graduate from the season of life, we never graduate from grace. From the words of Paul to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. These words from Ephesians resonate with me so deeply as I stand before you today. Over the last several months, I have wrestled with God's grace. After four years of education, studying God's word, serving in the local church, traveling all over the world on different mission trips, shouldn't a man like me be able to live a righteous life without this ugly and broken dependence on the grace of God? Shouldn't I have things figured out? I mean, grace is for those people, not for me. However, as I stand in my own self-righteous attitude, my sin seems to rear its head in worse ways than before. I feel exactly like what David writes in Psalm 51, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. My guilt, my shame, my fear of condemnation weighs me down for I chose not his grace so an ugly cycle begins that drives me further into self-dependence, further into shame, and further away from his grace. My relationships suffer, my coworkers suffer, and the church suffers because I think it's on my shoulders to build the church. I work from a place of fear rather than a place of faith. I work for his love rather than live in his love. I try to earn his favor rather than enjoy his favor. And I work for grace rather than work from grace. We never graduate from his grace. There is never a moment or a nanosecond of a day in which we are not in desperate need of the grace of God. If what Paul writes is true, if we were dead following the ways of the world, obedient to Satan, and children of wrath, then we desperately need a solution. Without the grace of God, we would rightfully deserve the wrath of God. For as Isaiah writes, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Even what we consider good works and good behavior before God is evil in his eyes, if not completely saturated with the blood of Christ. We might preach the greatest sermon, lead the greatest worship service, and build the greatest systems and programs and counsel people better than they could have imagined. But without his grace, it amounts to nothing. We never graduate from our need 
for grace. As I continue to journey with Jesus, I have recognized that grace is far more than our way to get out of hell for free. Grace does lead to salvation, but more than that, grace changes us. Grace is what brings us from dead and rotting corpses to be made alive in Christ and united with Christ. This salvation, this changed life brought on by grace is active and present to this very day. And just as repentance isn't a one-time thing that happened several years ago, grace too is daily and an ongoing need. I like to think of it like this. Each day when we arise in our beds and lift our head off of our pillows, there is a magnificent and glorious gift, a box at the foot of our bed. This gift has grace written all over it. And each morning we must choose to receive, open, and enjoy this gift of grace. And inside this box, God expresses his grace in thousands of ways. The air you breathe, it is his grace. The meal you eat, it is his grace. The friends you work with, it is his grace. The money you make serving the church, it is his grace. The car you drive, it's his grace. The way you live, it's because of his grace. Walking in his presence, it's his grace. His spirit within us, it is his grace. Saying no to the course of this world, it is by his grace. The author of Lamentations says it like this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. You never graduate from your need of grace. And when I open this gift and receive this grace, I walk in an understanding of my unity with Christ. This union with Christ might be one of the most significant things I have learned in my four years of education and one that I cannot fathom to this day, that I am so covered by Christ that when God looks at me, he does not see filthy rags, he sees robes of righteousness, earned not by my own righteousness, but by his righteousness. When God looks down from heaven, he doesn't see you He sees Jesus. So again, I say we never graduate from his grace. Today, as we receive a certificate and a well-deserved diploma at the culmination of a long season of education, as we continue to serve the bride of Christ, my appeal to you, students, is this. Don't lose your awe of his grace. And don't forget your need for his grace. Each morning his mercies are new, so each morning receive his grace. Each morning walk in his grace. Each morning enjoy his grace. And each morning as you receive his grace, give this same grace to every person you encounter. For you never graduate from your need for his grace. Thank you. So we have some uh, academic awards that we give at graduation every year, and these are voted on by the faculty and every year, and this was especially bad year of making choices because we have so many wonderful graduates, but we'd like to offer some awards at this time, and we'll start with one given by Dr. Bob Milliken. Approved unto Christ, the Delta Epsilon Chi Honor Society encourages and honors outstanding academic scholarship, approved Christian character, and Christian leadership ability among the accredited schools of the Association for Biblical Higher Education. 
The name Delta Epsilon Chi signifies approved unto Christ and comes from the first letter of the three Greek words of this phrase from Romans 16.10. Students eligible for membership must have achieved a cumulative GPA of at least 3.3 and have exhibited Christian character and leadership ability. Membership is conferred by the Delta Epsilon Chi Executive Committee upon recommendation by the Nebraska Christian College faculty. The recipient will receive this beautiful certificate suitable for framing and also a medallion with the Delta Epsilon Chi insignia, uh, which includes a Bible above which is a tongue of fire. May the Holy Spirit and God's holy word keep each of us approved unto Christ. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul urges his son in the faith to be diligent to show himself approved unto God. Today we will confer this honor on one graduate. But I pray we will all take these words to heart. This year's Delta Epsilon Chi Award goes to Cole Denny. Each year, our Merit Award is given to a student in recognition of outstanding contribution to the college in scholarship, leadership, attitude, participation, and Christian character. The student receiving this award this year has excelled in all of these areas. I always find it an honor to work with students and to teach them, and uh, this particular student uh, I have particularly felt honored to have the opportunity not only to teach him, but to learn from him. And uh, I believe that many students currently enrolled at Nebraska Christian College have been blessed by his ministry, by his leadership. Many of them have uh, pursued cross-cultural missions opportunities as a result of his influence. And uh, so it's my honor to present the Merit Award to Brandon Allen Grant. Uh -huh. The Progress Award is awarded at commencement in recognition of significant spiritual growth during one's attendance at Nebraska Christian. And this year, there are two students receiving this award, both who I feel very close to and very deserving of this award. So would you join me in congratulating Kayla Hamer and James Mueller. The Service Award is pre presented for extraordinary service to Christ 
and to the community beyond everyday notice of others. In 2014, the Service Award received a new name and is now known as the Linda Lou Lloyd Service Award. Linda Lou Lloyd was a graduate 1978 of Nebraska Christian College. She was a dear friend to many and our colleague here at Nebraska Christian College for 35 years. She passed away suddenly on December 5th, 2012, and is remembered for her cheerfulness, dedication, and spirit of service. It is fitting to honor a st student who follows her selfless example. And this year, we have two recipients of the Linda Lou Service Award, Amy Ann Van Dorsten and Joseph Michael McKernan. Last summer, one of the giants in the history of Nebraska Christian College passed away, Lauren Thomas Swedberg, who had served the college since 1953 and served as the academic dean from 1957 to 1984, the longest serving academic dean and a person who I'm very humbled to sit in his chair. We've honored him with a memorial empty chair here this morning to remember him. And I am going to suggest that we change, as we change the name of the service award to the Linda Lou Lloyd Service Award, that we change the name of the Dean's Cup Award to the Swedberg Dean's Cup Award for the future. This is like our version of the valedictorian award that some schools give. The award is given at commencement to the bachelor's degree graduate having the highest cumulative grade point average, has to be at least a 3.5, we didn't have a problem with that this year. There have been years when this award was not uh, given because nobody got a 3.5. <laughs> Has to have a minimum of 64 credit hours earned at Nebraska Christian College. The Dean's Cup uh, Award is engraved with the honoree's name and also a perpetual trophy that we keep that we're actually on the second or third uh, set of names because this award is, is the oldest award in the history of the college. The recipient of the Dean's Cup Award this year is Reed J. Milliken. I'd like to send our congratulations to all the award recipients. And uh, we have one, any more awards? Okay. Um, for your accomplishments, I think these are great recognitions of the uh, effort you've put forth and uh, to be acknowledged in this way by your peers and your faculty who have taught you for these last several years uh, is very meaningful. And I'm, I'm sure your families are quite proud of you as we are. At Nebraska Christian College, we believe it's very important for our students to understand the impact they can have on the world by being effective church leaders. Uh, we want them to use their knowledge and their special talents to make a difference wherever God leads them. And our guest speaker today is someone who has done just that. Glenn Elliott is the lead pastor of Pantano Christian Church in Tucson, Arizona, where he has served for 19 years. Now, this is a dynamic and growing congregation with over 2,000 members that has an excellent program of mentoring and developing fine future leaders. Glenn also has a passion for mission work around the world and for planting new churches. He has served as a missionary in the Ukraine and was instrumental in establishing a ministry training institute there which, with which Hope International University has had a long-standing and continuing relationship. 
Glenn was a student and graduate of Hope International University, which was then known as Pacific Christian College, where he served as an RA and later became the Dean of Students. In fact, it was 40 years ago that Glenn graduated from Hope International University, and he spoke at our commencement services in California last Saturday, and I asked if he would speak here as well. He has always been an outstanding role model of a humble servant who loves the Lord and wants to share that with others. He and his wife, Jolene, have two adult children and one grandchild, and he is the author of How to Grow an Effective Missions Program in Your Church, two Bible study workbooks, and numerous articles published in Christian Standard. Please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, Mr. Glenn Elliott. It is an honor uh, to be with you. It's my first time here at Nebraska Christian College, and as uh, uh, President Derry uh, just told you, I graduated from Pacific Christian College 40 years ago uh, this month. Uh, and, and my time at uh, Hope International, which then was Pacific Christian College, was, was an incredible experience for me. It, it really was one of those critical experiences in my life that helped me to be able to write a good story. Uh, I'm not saying that I've written the best story. There are certainly times I've made mistakes in my story. There are times that I've missed incredible opportunities, but I've been able to write a good story, and it was that foundation that I got uh, at uh, Pacific Christian College that was so critical. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about us as we think about our lives and as we think about the story that we're writing. Uh, many of us here, uh, I hope someday all of us here have chosen to live as a child of God. And, and we chose to follow Jesus because we knew that we needed help from the best author ever to help us write our story. That's why we decided to follow Jesus. And so as you think of your life as a story, consider these things. First of all, as long as you're alive, graduates, you're writing your story. And just because you're graduating, you're not done with your story. It's actually just one more chapter that's going to lead you to continue to write your story. We can't change our past story. Some of us wish that that wasn't a part of our story, but we can build on it. And the challenge that we face, especially I want to give to you as graduates, is that how do we keep writing a better and better story? And, and what I want to talk about today is how we go about doing that. Our story, if you really think about it, it's made of all kinds of decisions. We've made some significant decisions uh, along the way. In fact, all of you who are graduating, you made a decision to start something. You enrolled at Nebraska Christian College. That was a huge decision that you made. And that decision then led to a lot of other decisions that you've had to make along the way. And, and, and that decision, it cost you. It cost you a lot of money, didn't it? It cost you time. It cost you a lot of late nights and early mornings. You had to say no to some things that you would have much preferred to do rather than study or prepare for an exam. But you did it, and well done in making that decision to get your degree. For some of you, it was an easy decision to enroll. The harder decision came later to stick with it. You might have come to that time of discouragement and, and frustration and, and maybe were even tempted not to finish. It wasn't easy. Of course, now you're glad that you stuck with it, that you made that decision to, to plow through this and to get your degree. You see, the decisions that we make, they do determine our destination. And so now what's next? How will you use this chapter of your life to build and to be able to write even a better chapter and better chapters in the future. And I think as we think about how we write a better chapter, we really come to this critical question. And frankly, I'm amazed at how few actually ask this question or maybe rarely ask this question. And, and the question, it's not complicated, but it's significant. And, and it's simply this. What is the story that God wants you to write? What's the story that God wants you to tell? How will you keep writing a better story that will not only honor Jesus, but will truly make a difference in the lives of others in this life and for eternity? 
How, what's the story that you're going to tell? Now, that means there's lots of decisions that we make along the way to write that better story. And, and, and I think back to my time at, at Pacific Christian College. As a freshman, uh, I made a huge decision that at the time I didn't even realize how significant it was. I was uh, in a class, I was listening to a professor, and I thought, this is all very good. It was, it was, a, uh, it was a kind of an introductory course on ministry. And I went up to the professor. We had just been in class just a few weeks, and I said, I, I get what you're saying. I want, to, to, I want to serve God's church. I don't know how. Help me. And I didn't know it, but what I was asking that professor to become was to become my mentor, which he became. Not only was he my mentor, but he came up, became a lifelong friend. And, and Dr. John Rao, who is now deceased, he gave me a love for God's church, a passion to see churches multiply and to plant new churches. He created in me something that truly really changed the trajectory of my life. It was a decision that had a huge uh, effect in my life. The decisions that we make today determine our destination tomorrow. And so, graduates, as you're closing this chapter of your life, you're not done writing. Not at all. And you're done maybe writing papers for a while. Yes. But you're not done writing the story of your life. The critical decisions that you make now going forward will determine the story that you tell tomorrow. And I think there are three critical categories of the kinds of decisions that we make. And, and, and I found these actually in a passage of Scripture. It's found in, in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And I want us to look at those, those things. And, and these are the decisions that we make that help us to write a better story. And so Hebrews chapter 12, just the first three verses, listen to these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for, for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, catch this, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the, the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer of Hebrews uh, uses a different metaphor than I did. It's a parallel metaphor. The, the metaphor I've been talking about is writing a story, and the metaphor that the writer of Hebrews uses is the metaphor of a race. But, but our story is like a race. It's like a marathon. You're just finishing one chapter of your race, but there are many more chapters in that race and that story that are yet to come. And, and, and the, what's interesting here is that he gives us the guidance of how to run that race or how to write that better story. And it begins with three categories of decisions. And one of them is, is the things that we need to stop. See, sometimes to write a better story, we have to stop doing some things. We have to eliminate some things from our lives. And it's interesting how the writer of Hebrews describes this. You see, this, he's writing this in a first century context. And he's talking about a race in the first century. And, and in those days, people wore these robes kind of like we're wearing today. Now, can you imagine running a race in a robe like this? Not going to work very well. It'll, it'll hinder you. It'll trip you up. And, and in those days, this is before Nike and Adidas, when they had went cool running shorts and cool running shoes. They had clunky sandals. And what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that if we're going to run a race, and, and this is how it was done in the first century, it seems kind of weird to us, but they, because they didn't have the Nike and, and Adidas stuff, they, they would take off their clumsy robes and clumsy sandals, and they would run barefoot and naked. And it wasn't about being naked. It was just that they, that would be unencumbered so that they could actually run the race and run it well. And in using our analogy, writing a, a better story. And so the question is this. What do you need to stop doing? What, what do you need to eliminate from your life that will hinder you from writing a better story? Maybe in these years here at Nebraska Christian, you've realized that there's been a fear that's been holding you back. It's time to get rid of that. Maybe there's been a level of insecurity that's, that, that's been there that's held you back and you need to get rid of that. Maybe 
it's been a habit that's hurt you and, and limited what God can do in and through you. Maybe it's been an addiction of some kind. Maybe it's a character trait. Maybe even certain people have, have hurt you and there's time to say enough. I need to put this behind me so that I can write a better story. And then there's another key decision that we see here in, in this passage in Hebrews, and it's the decision to start, a critical decision. You see, the start is that I'm willing to enter the race. I'm willing to run the race, the race that's marked out before us. And that's critical. Says, he says that we, we need to run the race that's marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. What's the story that Jesus wants me to tell? What's the race he wants me to run? How does he want me to live my life? We go constantly to him. We keep our eyes fixed on him saying, how are you wanting to lead me in this next chapter so that I can continue to write better and better chapters to create a better and better story? Now, the passage says that we're to run the race that's marked out for us. What, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, what it doesn't mean is that it's not that God has this exact specific plan for us, like, like where you'll live or who you'll marry or, or, or what kind of job that you'll get or what church you'll go to or what company you'll work with or, or what your next uh, degree will be necessarily. The race that we're running is that we're running towards Jesus, fixing our eyes on him. Because Always we write a better story as, it is, as we keep our eyes fixed on him, trying to think like Jesus more and more, trying to live like Jesus, act like Jesus, become like Jesus more and more. And so we have some critical decisions to make. We may need to stop some things. We may need to start something. And there's one more category of decision that we see here. This this. Decision isn't as exciting, if I can use the phrase, it's not as sexy as maybe the stopping and starting, but it's absolutely critical. It is a powerful decision that we make that shapes our story. It's the decision to stay. It's the decision to stick with something. It's the decision to persevere, to be resilient, to not grow weary and not give up. Let me illustrate this decision with a, with a man that at 16 submitted his first short story for publication and, uh, he, with a magazine, and, and he was rejected. And he kept trying. He kept submitting short, story, short stories for publication. He kept getting rejected. So he started putting those rejection letters on a nail, and pretty soon the nail filled up, so he had to put a spike in the wall, and he began to fill up that spike with all of the rejection letters. His first novel was rejected 30 times before it was published. Today, Stephen King has published over 200 short stories, 54 novels, 350 million copies have been purchased, and of course, many movies made from his stories. That's, that's a description of what it means to stick with it and not give up and not grow weary. This decision to stay is critical. Sometimes we need to stay with something, even sometimes with someone when it's hard. Let me just reread the passage from Hebrews, or part of it anyway. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you do not grow weary and give up. You don't grow weary and give up. I've been in full-time ministry now 40 years. I graduated 40 years ago. <clears throat> and in those 40 years... I've served as a pastor. I've served as a college administrator and professor. I've served as a missionary. And there were times it was really hard. Times it was painfully difficult. There were times that I felt incredibly isolated, misunderstood, alone. Many times I felt inadequate. 
I can remember a winter day, November, in Ukraine, just having arrived to do mission work and walking as the snow was falling on this Arizona boy, going, what in the world am I doing in this country? I don't know the language. I don't know the people. I don't even have a plan. I felt those times of incredible inadequacy. <clears throat> there have been times when I've been betrayed. There have been people, if you can believe this, that wanted my demise. There have been times when my family struggled and suffered, and there were a lot of times it would have been easy to say, I'm done. I'm done. But if I would have quit, I would have quit too soon. And I would have hindered God from being able to finish that chapter. And I would have hindered God from his ability to write in me and through me a better story. Over these 40 years, through our partners, I've been able to help start hundreds of churches. I've, I've seen thousands of people come to faith. I've been able to help start Christian institutions that are making a huge difference in this, in this world. I, I've seen villages and communities transformed. And if I would have given up, if I would have stopped when it was hard, we would have stopped some of those short stories short. Don't stop short of the better story that God wants you to write. You're able to celebrate today because you made the decision to finish. Congratulations. Well done. We're proud of you that you were able to finish and be able to graduate with your degree. But now don't settle for just good intentions. You see, good intentions won't shape your story. Good intentions won't help you to write a better story. But rather look to Jesus. Keep asking Jesus, how do you want me to keep writing a better story, a story that will impact lives, that will see the kingdom expand, and will see the influence of God grow now and forever? Ask Jesus, what do you need to stop? What do you need to start? What do you need to stick with to write the better story? So now as a graduate, you're not done. This is just the close of a chapter. It's a wonderful chapter that's closing. A great chapter. And some of you have been recognized and awarded for it. But now there's even more. There's more to write. And, and, and what you're going to write is even more profound than what you've experienced here at Nebraska Christian College. But keep your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith, Jesus. Keep writing a better story. And so as a graduate of Nebraska Christian College, use this chapter to help you truly make a difference. A story to write a story that honors God, honors his kingdom, and makes a difference in lives. May God help you and bless you as you write a better story.
we really need you. I don't want to leave my team one step if that's not your plan. Your presence does not go with us. Don't make us go, God. I don't want to go where you won't go. I don't want to be where you won't be. Shut up and prove it. My challenge is step up and lead it. that you can learn in ministry, please let it be humility. Claim with confidence the victory. Thank you. That was a project of our advanced video class this semester. We're very proud of what uh, the product was. So let's all get ready for the ceremony. Get your hats back on and would be on stage, take your places. I'd like to invite the AA degree people to come over and get in position. So while we're getting ready, just invite you also, uh, parents and friends of the graduates, uh, we are going to stop and take a picture over here. And if you'd like to come down to the front and take pictures, you're welcome to do that. We have our version of the red carpet background from Nebraska Christian College. So uh, don't, be, don't be shy if you want to come down here and take a picture. Mr. President, I'd like to present the following uh, candidates for graduation, the Associate of Arts degree in Christian Ministry, Marguerite Bethany Amos. Riley Thomas Stoffer. <laughs> 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 
So would you, uh, AA people, remain standing? And Dr. Derry has some things to say for you. Back to their seats there. Get them back. They're on their way. Upon the successful completion of all the requirements, and upon the recommendation by the faculty, and upon the approval of the Board of Trustees, I now confer upon you the degree of Associate of Arts from Nebraska Christian College of Hope International University, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. You may move your tassels from the left to the right as a symbol of your commencement. Right to the left. <laughs> And now with those receiving the Bachelor of Arts degree, please get in position over here. Mr. President, I present these uh, students for graduation honors. Cole Joseph Denny. Yeah. Cole is graduating cum laude. Also graduating cum laude, Kelsey Ray DePau. Dakota Michael Draper. Namuk David Duo. Austin Dakota Edelman. Brandon Allen Grant. Brandon is also graduating cum laude. Kayla Joyce Hamer. Corey James McCracken. <laughs> Joseph Michael McKernan. Reed J. Milliken. Reed is graduating with highest honors, summa cum laude. 
James August Mueller. Jed Allen Shermer. <laughs> Samantha Marie Shermer. Amber Rose Stackhouse. Upon the successful completion of all the requirements, <clears throat> upon the recommendation by the faculty and the approval of the Board of Trustees, I now award you the degree of Bachelor of Arts from Nebraska Christian College of Hope International University with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. You may now move your tassels as symbols of your completion. And now, now, if those uh, receiving the Bachelor of Worship Arts degree would take their place. Mr. President, I'd like to present the following students for the Bachelor of Worship Arts degree. Noah R. Anderson. <laughs> Graduating cum laude, Jeffrey Andrew Dirks. Ashley Marie Hall. <laughs> Sasha Grace Johnson. Wyatt R. Johnson. <laughs> Brielle McKenna Lang.
Kyle J. Ranny. David D. Schomer. <laughs> Amy Ann Van Dorsten. Lexi Lynn Wagner. Upon the successful completion of all the requirements and upon the recommendation by the faculty and the approval of the Board of Trustees, I now award you the degree of Bachelor of Worship Arts from Nebraska Christian College of Hope International University with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. You may now move your, sim your tassels as a symbol of your achievement. Please be seated. Thank you. Please be seated. As Dr. Haynes comes to present the charge to the graduates, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge those of you here who have contributed to this accomplishment. We realize that this would not have been possible without the support of many individuals. Uh, so if you are the parent or the spouse, some of these are, our students are married, if you are the parent or the spouse of one of these graduates, would you please stand so we can express our appreciation to you. Thank you so much for your confidence in, in Nebraska Christian College and uh, the investment you've made in their future here. Uh, I'd like the graduates, if we'd please to stand, and Dr. Haynes will come to deliver a charge to you. As they do, let's express our congratulations to them one more time. On behalf of it, the administrators, faculty, and staff of Nebraska Christian College, and in the presence of God and these witnesses, we charge you as the Apostle Paul charged Timothy. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Will you all stand with me for the benediction? And then immediately after this prayer, if everyone would please remain in their places, standing, we'll have the recessional, and once the faculty, the administrators, and the graduates are all out of the room, then you can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Receive this blessing. Grace and peace to you from him who was, who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. 
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.